This short video is designed to educate our program partners about two of the key HVAC commissioning tests required for our program, assessing the refrigerant charge and measuring two electrical parameters of the HVAC equipment. These requirements are contained in sections 6, 7, and 8 of the HVAC System Quality Installation Contractor Checklist. My name is Dean Gamble. I'm the Technical Coordinator for EPA's Energy Star Certified Homes Program, and I'll be narrating this video. Throughout this video, you'll see Rob George. He helps provide contract support to the Energy Star Certified Homes Program and has over 30 years of experience in the HVAC industry. You may already know that the subcooling and superheat temperatures are an indication of proper refrigerant charge and that these values can be calculated by measuring the pressure and temperature of the refrigerant. This is what we'll watch Rob do in this video. While most partners will likely measure these values to assess refrigerant charge, Note that other OEM recommended procedures, such as the approach method, are also permitted to be used. Before starting the test, Rob first measures the dry bulb temperature outside of the condenser. He'll be using a digital psychrometer to measure this value, which looks like this. This can also be used to measure wet bulb temperatures, which we'll show in just a minute. If the temperature is 55 degrees or less, or below the manufacturer recommended operating temperature for the cooling cycle, then the refrigerant charge test can be skipped as long as the equipment has a thermostatic expansion valve, also known by its abbreviation, TXV. If the temperature is above 55 degrees, or the manufacturer recommended operating temperature, then we can proceed with the test. In this case, we can see that the temperature is 87.6 degrees, so we're fine to proceed. The other temperature we need to measure is the return air wet bulb temperature. This can be done any time while we're inside of the air handler by inserting the digital psychrometer into the return air stream. The best place to do that on a gas furnace, as shown here, is to remove the main limit control and insert the probe into the air stream there. It will sense any motor heat and indicate the full load on the coil. If that is inaccessible, or if it is an electric air handler, then anywhere upstream of and as close as possible to the coil will do. If necessary, Use a step drill to drill a test hole in a duct or transition upstream of the coil. Here we see that the wet bulb temperature is 65.1 degrees. Now Rob returns outside. He removes the access panel on the condenser while the unit is de-energized so that he can reach the refrigerant ports and measure the electrical parameters. He then turns on the AC system. Next, Rob measures the current and voltage of the electrical disconnect of the compressor using his multimeter, which looks like this. First, he uses a voltmeter to measure the voltage at the disconnect. We can see here that he measures a value of 246.6 volts. Next, he uses an amp meter to determine the current. We can see here that he measures a value of 8.8 .8 amps. Of course, HVAC contractors should always take special care to safely measure electrical characteristics. When comparing these to the tolerances documented by the manufacturer, Rob finds that the values are well within the tolerance. Now that the air conditioner has been running for 15 minutes and is in a steady state operating condition, Rob can measure the subcooling and superheat temperatures. To do this, he'll be using a digital manifold, which looks like this. First, Rob attaches the low loss couplings to the digital manifold. He connects a suction fitting first. Next, he purges the manifold to avoid contaminating the system. Now that the manifold has been purged, Rob can connect the final fitting on the liquid line. Next, Rob connects the two temperature clamps to the suction and liquid lines. The digital manifold he's using will measure both the temperature and pressure of the refrigerant and automatically calculate the saturation, superheat, and subcooling temperatures. Automating this process is a big time saver and can also improve the accuracy of the measurements. Keep in mind that the Energy Star Certified Homes program only requires that you either measure the superheat or the subcooling temperature, depending on the type of metering device in the equipment. However, it's so simple to measure both with the digital manifold that Rob will be recording both sets of results. Here we see Rob cycling through the results on the digital manifold. To help you better see what Rob saw, we've illustrated the field results that Rob found. The screen shows both the refrigerant temperatures on the top half of the screen and the refrigerant pressures on the bottom half of the screen. The left half of the screen shows the temperature and pressure for the suction line that runs from the evaporator to the condenser unit. 
while the right half of the screen shows the values for the liquid line that runs from the condenser unit to the evaporator. The first screen that Rob is looking at shows the actual measured pressures and measured temperatures of the R410A refrigerant in the suction line and the liquid line. Now Rob is cycled through to the second screen. The same measured pressures are shown on the bottom, but now the temperatures shown on top have changed. Instead of the measured temperatures, they now show the saturation temperatures corresponding to the measured pressures, which the manifold automatically calculates using a pressure temperature lookup table. Now Rob is cycled through to the third screen. Again, the same measured pressures are shown on the bottom, but now the temperatures on top are the difference between the measured temperatures from the first screen and the saturation temperatures from the second screen. That is to say, the temperatures on this screen are the superheat and subcooling values. Now the test is complete. Rob simply needs to complete sections 6 through 8 of the checklist with the values he's collected. First, Rob will complete section 6. For item 6.1, Rob records the dry bulb air temperature he recorded outside of the condenser, 87.6 degrees. The value for item 6.2 is the indoor wet bulb air temperature that Rob measured, 65.1 degrees. Items 6.3 through 6.6 .6 are used to record the measured pressure and temperature in the liquid line and the measured pressure and temperature in the suction line. These are the values that we saw on the first screen of the digital manifold. Now Rob can move on to section 7. For systems with a TXV, items 7.1 through 7.4 must be completed. For item 7.1, Rob records the refrigerant saturation temperature in the liquid line after the condenser. This was automatically calculated by the digital manifold and reported on the second screen. Alternatively, the contractor could have determined this value manually using a pressure temperature chart and the measured pressure value from item 6.3. For item 7.2, Rob records the subcooling value. Again, this was automatically calculated by the digital manifold and reported on the third screen. Alternatively, the contractor could have calculated this value by subtracting the measured liquid line temperature in item 6.4 from the liquid line saturation temperature in item 7.1. Item 7.3 is used to document the manufacturer's subcooling goal, that is to say, the ideal subcooling temperature. Rob found this value in the manufacturer's installation manual, 10 degrees. Finally, item 7.4 is used to calculate and record the difference between the actual subcooling temperature and the target subcooling temperature. In this case, the difference is 1.9 degrees. For systems without a TXV, items 7.5 through 7.8 are completed instead. The process is very similar to that used for the subcooling section. For item 7.5, Rob records the saturation temperature in the suction line after the evaporator. Again, this was reported on the second screen, but could have been determined manually using a pressure temperature chart. For item 7.6, the actual superheat value from the third screen is recorded. The value could have also been calculated by subtracting the measured suction line temperature in item 6.6 .6 from the saturation temperature in item 7.5. Item 7.7 .7 is used to document the target superheat temperature. In this case, the equipment had a TXV, so no target superheat temperature was provided. Instead, for illustration purposes, a target was calculated using guidance from California's energy code. Item 7.8 is used to calculate and record the difference between the actual superheat temperature and the target superheat temperature. In this case, the difference is 5.7 degrees. Item 7.9 is used to evaluate the difference between our target temperature and our actual temperature. For systems with a TXV, the difference in subcooling temperature must be less than or equal to 3 degrees. For systems without a TXV, the difference in superheat temperature must be less than or equal to 5 degrees. In this case, we can see that we're well within the subcooling range. We're slightly outside of the superheat range, but that's okay. This system has a TXV, so only the subcooling test applies. The last item in this section is item 7.10. Here, Rob indicates whether he used a manufacturer-approved test other than superheat or subcooling to assess refrigerant charge. That's not the case here, so we mark NA. If this had occurred, Rob would have had to provide manufacturer documentation defining the test that was used and would have marked section 6 and item 7.1 through 7.9 as NA.
Finally, Rob completes Section 8. We previously completed item 8.1 in a different video. So now, Rob simply records the amperage and voltage values he recorded at the condenser in item 8.2, and then documents in item 8.3 that the measured values were within the OEM specified tolerance. As you can now see, in about 15 minutes, Rob has checked the refrigerant charge, as well as measured two key electrical parameters at the condenser. We've completed sections 6, 7, and the last half of section 8 of the checklist. HVAC equipment is an expensive investment for any home and plays a critical role in maintaining comfort and efficiency. Spending 15 or so additional minutes to conduct these tests is a good investment for contractors, builders, and homeowners. That's why they're required for every home that earns the Energy Star. Plus, contractors that invest in these tools and procedures can provide these valuable services in all new and existing homes, not just Energy Star certified homes. Thanks for watching this video. For more information, please visit energystar.gov slash newhomeshvac.